Thank you, Mr. President. Um, before I start my formal remarks, I'd just like to have a few, uh, make a few comments about what's just occurred in terms of the cloture vote, in terms of some of the discussion that we've had uh, most recently. But I wanted to react, first of all, to something that the minority leader said in his remarks. He basically said that we as Republicans uh, are trying to rewrite history. Uh, and he went into a, a long explanation of why he believed that. And it really struck me with these young folks who are sitting right here in front of us, we're not trying to rewrite history. We're trying to write a future, a future for these young folks that's safer, that, that, that is strong, that is where we as the United States are making agreements that are in their best interests, not just for tomorrow or the next five years or six years, but to the next 30, 35, 40 years. So rewriting history I'm not interested in, but writing a history for the future I am interested in. The other uh, reaction I would have is whether, uh, and I'm very disappointed in what's happened here that we can't have a straight up and down vote. When I was in uh, the West Virginia legislature in the House of Delegates, believe it or not, our votes were not taken, they were voice voted except in very rare occasions when we would have a roll call. Well, we all know the difference between a voice vote and a roll call vote. A roll call vote, you're, it's part of history. People see exactly what you're intending and how you're going to vote. A voice vote, you could almost say, well, I voted yes or I voted no, depending. Nobody can really pin you down on that. And I was one of the few Republicans in the House of Delegates who, said, who, who voted in favor of making every single vote we have a roll call vote. And I'm pleased to say the legislature, they didn't change it that year, but they finally did change it. So as the senator from Virginia said, everybody knows what everybody's going to do on this vote. So I don't understand what the controversy is to move forward over the procedural motions to then have that vote, to have it a part of history. This is your roll call vote. This is your voice on this Iran agreement. So I hope next week that the... Um, that the, uh, the body changes their mind and we move forward and we have an affirmative vote on the motion of disapproval. Today I wanted to talk obviously about this issue because I have deep concerns about it. Uh, and I believe that this debate um, should, should revolve around three key questions. Will this agreement eliminate Iran's path to a nuclear weapon? Will it improve the security situation in the Middle East? And it will make America safer for, the young, for us and for the future generations. And unfortunately, after much study, I've concluded that the answer is no, no, to all of these questions. I do not believe the president's agreement will make America safer or our allies safer. And to the contrary, the agreement will provide Iran with the resources to continue to finance terrorism throughout the Middle East and around the world. Even if Iran were to comply with this agreement in full, the deal virtually guarantees that Iran will become a nuclear threshold nation with an industrial nuclear program. We know that. It, will, it is legitimized in this agreement. Iran is the world's largest state sponsor of terror. Everybody has said that in this body. It is acknowledged nationwide. The windfall of cash that will flow to Iran, the signing bonus, and the continuing impact of sanctions relief under this deal will only increase its ability to prop up the Syrian regime, finance Hezbollah, and, their, and, their, and threaten America's allies like Israel. You know, it's one of these axioms you learn when you grow up, past behavior is a great predictor of future action. Even as its own economy has been hampered by the economic sanctions and the pressure from those sanctions brought Iran to the table in the name of our, our people are suffering, whether it's food or whether it's economic conditions, enough to bring that country to the table, what have they been doing? They have been financing terror in their region. Terrorism is a priority for them, even as their own people are suffering. National Security Advisor Susan Rice agrees. She says, quote, we should expect that some portion of the money would go to the Iranian military and could potentially be used for the kinds of bad behavior that we have seen in the region up until now, end quote. That's our national security advisor. Uh, the president said and the secretary of state have said that the sanctions will snap back, snap back, 
into place if Iran violates this agreement. I've been in Washington now for 15 years. I've never seen anything snap anywhere in, what? in, the, in the halls of Congress. We know that the current sanctions against, um, against Iran cannot be easily snapped back. We know that. It just it does, it doesn't even pass the sniff test, as we'd say. It took more than a decade for the United States working with our allies to construct the sanctions that brought Iran to the table. This type of effective sanctions regime cannot be brought back over and over again. And I've heard, I've listened to a lot of speeches, and a lot of my colleagues on both sides, no matter how they voted or what they believe, have said the exact same thing. On another note, we need to examine the end of the international restrictions on selling ballistic missile technology to Iran and the end of conventional, the conventional arms embargo contained in this agreement. The chairman of our Joint Chiefs of Staff told the Senate Armed Services Committee in July that, quote, under no circumstances should we relieve pressure on Iran relative to ballistic missile capabilities and arms trafficking. The administration chose to reject this advice. It really surprised many of us who did not know that these were even on the table. We didn't even know they were even part of a bargaining chip that anybody was going to play. The president's agreement would remove all international limitations on Iran's missile program in eight years, contradicting early promises from the administration that restrictions would remain in place. Ballistic missiles are not a necessary component of a peaceful nuclear program. Iran's continued efforts to improve this technology should be sent a clear message to this chamber of their intentions. In addition, the arms embargo on conventional arms will be lifted in five years. Indeed, Iran's president said last month, quote, we will buy, sell, and develop any weapon we need, and we will not ask permission or abide by any resolution for that, end quote. The end of the arms embargo and the ballistic missile restrictions will strengthen Iran's ability to threaten American and ally forces and citizens. The president's agreement does not contain the necessary enforcement measures to protect future generations from a nuclear Iran. Any agreement worthy of congressional approval should include rigorous, immediate inspection of suspected nuclear sites. Senior administration officials publicly called for anywhere, any place, I heard it repeatedly, inspections. Yet the president's agreement fails to live up to that. Indeed, Iran can block access to its suspected nuclear facilities for 24 days or even longer. And we have not even seen these side deals. Uh, this is part of the discussion. The bill that we passed that said that we were going to have the right to debate this says explicitly in the, in the language that the side agreements were to be turned over to Congress for our inspection before we made this vote. And finally, those who support ratifying the Iran agreement frequently argue that the only alternative is war. Well, I disagree. I reject that notion. Under that false guided premise, the American people are being told we should simply accept any deal regardless of how flawed it may be. When asked if our only option was, was the agreement or war, the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff said that, quote, we have a range of options. The president's agreement does not live up to the administration's prior statements on important items like inspections, elimination of advanced centrifuges and ballistic missiles. A better agreement with Iran could be forged from the positions taken by senior administration officials during the uh, negotiation. A better deal was possible. And the American people should accept nothing less. Some argue that we should approve the deal despite its faults and then use this, the threat of separate legislation or tough talk to keep Iran in check. To me, that's just seeking cover for those of us who are gonna vote in agreement uh, with, this agree with this Iran agreement. Uh, then to turn around in a week or 10 days or two days and say, let's get tough on Iran on this. Let's make sure we protect Israel. Let's give more military aid to Israel. All of the rhetoric that you're sort of already hearing, we can, we can do that now. We can do that now by disagreeing with the Iran agreement that the president's put forward. The better course for us is to reject this agreement and reopen negotiations. I believe stronger sanctions could also force Iran to accept a better agreement that will improve the security of the Middle East and the world. The danger to the United States, Israel, and other American allies posed by Iran is real. As the current refugee crisis and prior acts of terrorists clearly demonstrate, 
Instability and violence in the Middle East reverberates into other parts of the world. I do not believe that the President's agreement reduces that threat of violence or adds to the stability of the region. Instead, instead, the agreement will strengthen Iran's position. You can already tell by their swaggering bravado of, of um, rhetoric that we hear and lead the United States with fewer ways to combat nuclear proliferation. For these reasons, I will vote to reject the president's nuclear agreement with Iran.